I am going to be a sycophantic piece of trash for a minute. And trust me, if I heard somebody else saying this, I'd be like, man, that guy is such a loser. I want to punch him right in the face. But given everything that has happened in AEW over the last week and since October 2019, I just want to say thank you very much, Tony Khan. I am enjoying your product very much, Lee. It makes me feel all warm and fuzzy in my tum-tum. And it gets me excited about professional wrestling. That's all I need in my life. And of course, this was a big episode of AEW Dynamite because it was hot off the heels of CM Punk returning to pro wrestling. Everyone be like, oh my gosh, I'm melting down. I can't believe this is happening. But does that mean it gets an up or does that mean it gets a down? There's only one way to find out and you have done it already. You clicked the video. So let's up those downs for AEW Dynamite. <laughs>I was so excited for this episode of AEW Dynamite because we'd set the hook, not that one, and I just wanted to see what was going to go down. And the ridiculous thing here is said hook was just, man, says some words. And basically what I'm telling you here is that I was very pumped for this CM Punk interview. Before we get into the show properly too, once again, all you lovely human beings have just showered me with praise as well because there was no less than three Simon give me an up signs on this week's episode of AEW Dynamite. And the even better thing about this is sometimes I don't see them because I'm a bored a-hole, but you send them to me on Twitter and that makes water come out of my eyes. I think all of you are just wonderful, wonderful individuals. And as always, you all get it up. Our very first contest of this evening, though, was Matt Hardy taking on Orange Cassidy. Because as you know, they've been involved in some kind of a blood feud. And my word, that was very literal tonight. I just kind of felt like the world was against this one. They started off with the whole hands in my pocket delete back and forth, which I'm always going to enjoy because as you know, I'm a massive fan of goofy professional wrestling. And what I especially liked here is that Matt Hardy at one point pulled a bunch of money out of his pockets. And when Orange Cassidy got said money, later on Matt was like, nope. And he took back his cash. Those kind of things will always make me laugh. The real problem was halfway through, Matt Hardy's nose was busted open and I think it may have been broken after he's hit with a crossbody or a DDT. And all I could do for the rest of this thing was look at it and think to myself, what the hell has happened to that man's face? Because it looked super duper nasty. Then all of a sudden, Orange Cassidy was being Jeff Hardy as he was doing Swan Tom Bombs and he even tried to do a twist of fate. That didn't work out very well. It also had kind of a weird finish because from nowhere, Orange just did hit the most devastating move in all of sports entertainment, the surprise roll up, put his hands back in his pockets and he got the one, two, three. And this took me so much by surprise. I looked at my television and I just went, oh. and do not get me wrong, this was more than fine. I always enjoy the silliness. Maybe we've just kind of got into a pattern where dynamite does start and it's all go, 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 100 miles per hour. But by the time we got to the end of this one, well, yeah, I just felt just a teeny weeny little bit flat. Maybe that's me. Maybe I should have drunk some coffee, but I am going to give it a down. Malachi Black then told us that if Brock Anderson does come to the ring later for their match, he's going to kill him. And I think he meant it too. I saw the knife. I'm kidding, there was no life. Seriously, though, this felt like the entire thing was a terrible idea and that AEW were crazy for even sanctioning it to begin with. That just makes the character of Malachi Black come across as terrifying. So I think we're doing our job. All Elite Wrestling then kept things simple. And as we are remembering, sometimes in pro wrestling, that's all you need to do. Up. Because Chris Jericho is out and man, he's so sad now because he went through all these labors and he put his body against everything. But when push came to shove and it was time to take down MJF from his pedestal, not only did he lose, but he tapped out so now he doesn't know what the hell to do and he just walks around with his brain going, MGF, 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 MGF. That doesn't sound very healthy, Chris. I think you should go talk to someone. Instead, he has come up with another plan, which is to have one more contest against Maxwell Jacob Friedman at All Out Pay-Per-View. And if he loses, he shall retire to the commentary desk forever. Now, I totally get it. In professional wrestling, when we do have the, oh my gosh, they're going to leave the company stipulation, you instantly go, well, I doubt that is going to happen because it rarely happens. However, I think AEW has done enough in the past just to plant that teeny bit of sound of doubt where you go, well, maybe, just maybe, and maybe is all you ever need. Jericho called Maxwell out and eventually he did arrive and he acted like a girlfriend that had broken up with their boyfriend and was sick and tired of their ex-partner, kept calling. He was like, Chris Jericho, I'm done with you. You're really boring. And he had a t-shirt on. that said MGF3 Jericho Zero and it looked like some kid had designed it. However, as sweet as it was making a champion tap out, 
What would be even better and the cherry on the top would be retiring Chris Jericho. So he accepted and said, of course, when it comes to the pay-per-view, I'm going to win. Maybe he will, maybe he won't. That's why you buy it to find out. And I've seen some of the criticism with some people saying, man, we should be done with this by now. But I think we need to put a little bit of faith in All Elite Wrestling. They barely let us down before. So I'm going to wait and see. Quick promo with the Varsity Blondes who said they're going to beat the Lucha Brothers in around about the next eight seconds to go on to the finals of the Tag Team Title Eliminated Tournament. Kind of sucked to be them because they were wrong. The Young Bucks came out to watch this because of course they are the champions. And sure, maybe this wasn't as good as some people were expecting, but it's like pizza. Every time you eat it, it always gives you something and it makes you feel satisfied to some level. I'm giving it up. My man Griff Garrison, hope you're well dude, and Phoenix started things off. But when they realized they were basically each other's equal, they tagged in Penta and Brian Pillman Jr. who had a very different way of approaching this because Penta just booted Brian right in the face. So Brian hit up Step Up Rana. And I think this annoyed the masked man even more because he just chopped the shit out of him. I felt it in my house. And admittedly, there were some wobbly moments here, but remember one, they're human. And two, these moves are called high risk maneuvers because the risk is maybe they're not going to come off. But we still saw a bunch of stuff. You're like, how are they doing this? I can't even get out of bed in the morning without hurting my ass. And we saw like an assisted top rope dive. These people don't make any sense. The Blondes were able to fight back with Griff Garrison hitting a crossbody onto Phoenix, but I think this worried Penta as he saw all his tag team dreams and hopes floating away. So once again, we had a finish out of nowhere. They just hit the spike par driver. One, two, three, and that was this. But look, man, a clean finish on a wrestling show. I will take that any day of the week. And straight after this, the Jurassic Express were here and they stared down with their next challenges. When, of course, the Young Bucks got involved because Matt and Nick Jackson are a couple of goofs. But they pushed the boy and the dinosaur into the Lucha Brothers, hoping this would spark a massive brawl. But this didn't work. And these four guys all worked their ass instead. I just want to say, I enjoy how much of the butt of the joke the Young Bucks will always make themselves. It's almost like... That's their job. Andrade and Ooh Chavo were then backstage and they said that yes, come all out, Andrade is going to beat Pac because Andrade is the better wrestler. And I did my wrestling mass and that is true. If you have better wrestler taking a worse wrestler, nine times out of ten, the better wrestler will win. As ever, the build to this has just been absolutely crazy. But that match is going to be fire, and I truly mean this could even steal the show. Jamie Hayter and Red Velvet then had a really good match with one noticeable mistake. But you want to know what? I thought they dealt with this so well, it made me want to get up off my couch and just applaud them. Because wrestling is really hard, and they dealt with it like pros. Uh, Britt Baker and Rebel were here as well, and they were just attacking Red Velvet as many times as they could. Because even though they're meant to be the bad guys, they're treated like the good guys. So that's going to be very interesting going forward. And it seemed like Red Velvet had the win when she went for her standing moonsault. Very sadly for her, she landed right on her face. And there's every chance that I've been worked and this was the plan. And if so, damn right, give it to me. That's what pro wrestling is all about. But as soon as Jamie Hayter realized this, it was like a tiger who knew their prey was damaged. She got up, she whooped her ass, she hit her with this massive lariat and she pinned her for the one, two, three. And this was totally believable. Because one error led to the finish, which is what can happen in real sports. And honestly, they showed experience here beyond their years. I also think Jamie Hayter is going to be really good in a few weeks if she keeps decimating people like this. I enjoyed it muchly. Hater and Rebel then continued the assault afterwards until, of course, Chris Statlander was here being like, oh my gosh, can you believe it? I'm an alien. And we are going to do Britt Baker versus Chris Statlander at All Out. Once again, I'm fine with this too. Then the Dark Order fell out. And I was like, what is even the point anymore? Why don't you just rip my heart out of my soul like Kano and flush it down the toilet? I mean, what the flub is the point? Because they were stood here as a unit as Evil Uno tried to explain why they didn't help Hangman Adam Page a few weeks ago. When Alex Reynolds went, wait a minute, I don't agree with our actions. And you know what, Evil Uno? I think you're a crappy leader and I don't want to be your friend anymore. And he walked off. And this is probably because Uno snapped back at him and said, why don't you get out of John Silver's shadow? And I was like, oh man, that's going to be hard to come back from. And this was like watching your parents get divorced. I can't take this. I don't have the moxie to get through it. But my word, what an intriguing storyline and what a cool direction to take the Dark Order. And for that alone, is getting up. CM Punk then said words. Up. I know, that's ridiculous, but it's gonna be this way for a while. The novelty is just so joyous. Tony Schiavone was on interviewer duties here, and if you are interested in trivia, this is what they were gonna do on Rampage before Tony Khan changed his mind said, nah, man, let's just start the show and send CM Punk on out of there. And as always, the fans absolutely loved this. 
And some moron on Twitter went, well, it wasn't as loud as the other day. No, my friend, it wasn't. It wasn't as loud as one of the biggest bops in pro wrestling history. I mean, what planet are you living on? The amount of lines that Punk dropped here too. I mean, he put a bunch of the talent over in the back before he addressed Darby Allen and said, the big question I have for myself is, can I still go? And that journey starts with you, Darby Allen. By the way, also, if I was a 15-year-old kid, you would be my favorite wrestler at the time. Darby Allen, through all of this, is just becoming a bigger and bigger star. Crowd started to chant, yes, so CM then said, well, that's somebody else's stick, so you're going to have to be a little bit more patient. So now we're filling all the punk rumours with Daniel Bryan rumours, which is just going to leave me a mess on the floor because it's all too much for my brain. And then said he is returning not to prove the hate is wrong, but to prove himself right. My word, I couldn't be rooting for this man anymore. He also shouted out his wife AJ Lee to end this, so that was just lovely and wonderful and all positive type of words. And at the start of it, he also said that he's retiring the nickname The Voice of the Voiceless because wrestling does have a voice now. It's called AEW. This was truly tremendous. I'm also just genuinely happy that CM Punk is back and seeing how happy he is makes me more happy too. That's all we want in life. We just want to get through each and every day and feel warm and fuzzy in my tum tum. And at the moment it's overflowing, I'm gonna throw up. Miro then decided he wanted it on this too because he was cutting a backstage video promo talking about Eddie Kingston when he said, bring me the Mad King before I burn this place down. I tell you, Miro is the best person on the planet and I would hear the argument otherwise. This was also very handy because next up we did have Eddie Kingston, John Moxley and Darby Allen with Sting in their corner, taking on the wingmen with Peter Avalon in their corner and the word of the day or the word for the next 10 minutes was fun. Up. I was laughing right away because Ryan Nemeth was just posing in front of Eddie Kingston like he was just thrusting his groin as if that's a really good idea. So do you know what Ed did back? Just took his hand and he chopped the shit out of him. Once again, I was chuckling away. I'm a very stupid man. I think this offended Cesar Benoni because he got in there and started getting into like a shoulder tackle battle with Eddie Kingston. But then Moxie was bored of all of this, so he threw everybody out the ring. I just want to say, between the wingmen and 2.0, I am filled up to my boots with nonsense tag teams and I can't get enough of it. Benoni actually took over for a while and beat up John Moxie before he got the tag to Eddie Kingston. And then there was a bit of hoopla that ended with Mox biting JD Drake's face. So he's totally insane. And of course, the next part was to hot tag in Darby Allen. He ran wild and he won. Fans went nuts too because he is the man and he did hit the coffin drop onto Jake to get the one, two, three. And the best part about all of it is that Sting was just being this intimidating figure on the outside constantly. This must be the best he's been used ever since his heyday in WCW. This continued too when Danny Garcia just ran out to try and attack Darby Allen, but he was chased away by Sting and friends. I'm really intrigued to see where we go with Danny Garcia and of course 2.0. The directions are endless. That's a massive over-exaggeration. What a great way to introduce a bunch of new talent. We also started to build towards the Casino Women's Battle Royal Hour, which is going to happen in the Buy and Drawing All Out, because Ty Conte was here saying, oh man, I'm going to win, when the bunny approached her and said, no, don't worry about that, come join the Hardy Family Stable, or whatever they're called. Conte didn't want to do that, so she ripped the contract up, and then they had a big fight. Was that legit worried about FTR as well? Now, maybe they're working me once again. Hell yeah, that's the whole point. But we had them here and they were talking about Cash Wheeler's injury. And if you haven't seen it and you have a strong stomach, go and look at it on the internet. It is disgusting. But the point is, is that maybe they only have one more match left in them because he can't go anymore. Now, I really hope this isn't true. And if it is true, I just want to send all the best wishes and health to him. But honestly, this really made me feel for the guy. I didn't really understand how bad it was. Wrestling, as we always forget, is so damn dangerous. We then had some solid stuff with our AEW World Title Program too. Uh, and the real joy of this was Kenny Omega and Don Callis. And I know I say this every single time, but on multiple occasions during this, they made me laugh out loud because they're just such idiots. And as it turns out, I really love idiots. I am learning a lot about myself. But eventually Christian Cage came out here because they were just insulting him. And they reminded us of the story that it was Don Callis who booked him in his first wrestling match before he fired his ass because of Christian reminded us he's nothing but a carly piece of shit.
All of a sudden, though, Omega had the microphone. <laughs> He started saying, do you think you know me? Do you think me know me? Which of course is the lyrics to Edge's theme. So that was it, I was gone. And then Don Callis continued this by saying, look, here's what you're gonna learn when we get to that pay-per-view. You've always been second best, which of course is another reference to Edge. Cage had had enough of this though, but he totally forgot how maths works. And he tried to beat up around about 32 people before thankfully Frankie Kazarian carried on his oath to his dying day, which is to hunt the elite came out with some kind of bat or some kind of weapon and he chased them all away. And all this did was make me want to see Christian Cage versus Kenny Omega. But more important than that, it made me laugh. And as I'm realizing, if you make me laugh in any walk of life, you win. We also then learned that John Moxley is going to be taking on Kojima at All Out. Now, I think originally it was meant to be Tanahashi, but plans change, pal. But who cares? Do you know how violent and how nuts and how hard hitting this thing is going to be? I'm here for it. It was then the factory taking on the gun club. And this was a little bit weird. Paul White was on commentary too, which made all the sense in the world because of course Paul White and QT Marshall are gonna face off at All Out. But then we got to the finish and I kind of just scratched my head. And it was fine throughout. And at one point QT Marshall was in charge. So he stood up and he pointed at Paul White and Paul White who was on commentary didn't like that. So he pointed right back. But because of this, he distracted himself. He got hit with the most devastating move in all of sports entertainment. Lost, one, two, three, and all of this kind of just happened. Now, once again, I wouldn't say it was bad and QT Marshall gets his role here and he played it perfectly, but this came and it went. The fans didn't really get into it because nobody was really sure what the point was and we haven't really seen the gun club much on Dynamite. I know they're connected, but I don't know. I don't really know what to say about it and they're all very talented but I do think it has to get a down. It was then revealed that Dan Lambert, I think, is now managing Ethan Page and Scorpio Sky. And I tell you, I never knew I needed these three people as a unit, but on this day, I've realized, yes, I do. They just look so good as a trio, and Lambert was running everybody down here, saying Orange Cassidy and Sammy Guevara sucks, because they're not real men, they're idiots, which is why the fans like them, because the fans also aren't real men and they're idiots. But I tell you who are real men, Scorpio Sky and Ethan Page, I am on the down low excited about this, they could become a very good act. And we then ended Dynamite with a murder. Shit. We started with Arn Anderson in the back who was telling us how worried he was about his son, which was absolutely true. Why the hell were we sending him to the ring? And then we did send him to the ring to take on Malachi Black, who, as I've already stated, basically murdered him. Now, Brock was able to get some offense in there, but that's the equivalent of me saying I'm not bald anymore because I was able to sprout a few hairs on my head. And basically, Malachi just black masked him right in the face and he pinned him. And look, all of this allowed Malachi Black to come across like some kind of demon warrior. So for that reason alone, I'm giving it up. What I didn't really understand, though, is what we did afterwards, because Aunt Anderson got in the ring, as he must do to protect his boy. Malachi Black went to give him the black mask. But like, I think Art Anderson has like a metal plate a la Lex Luger or something. He just blocked it with his arm, which begs the question why nobody else has done this, leading Malachi Black to boot him right in the balls. He then did hit the black mass on Arn Anderson when all of a sudden Lee Johnson was out here to save the day, which is fine. I think you need to build people by putting them in these kind of positions. But the commentators didn't react to his music for around about eight seconds. The fans didn't really know what was going on and it just felt a little bit rushed. And I'm all for trying new things as I've said time and time again. I have no problem with all of these guys being in the main event. Again, that's how you build stars. But did this come off the way that I think AEW wanted it to come off? guess the answer is no and like I said when the end credits rolled I was a bit like I don't know if I've missed something but I don't feel like I understand and Malachi Black is still the man I bet we do good things with Brock Anderson and Lee Johnson is going to be a super duper mega star but sometimes you swing and sometimes you miss there's nothing wrong with this again you've got to do the attempt but it does mean on a show called ups and downs we got to give it a down. And I also think it's kind of fair to say that maybe this wasn't the bombastic dynamite we were expecting after CM Punk, but let's all calm down. It was still more than watchable. I was sports entertained. It's absolutely getting an up, and I couldn't be more excited about All Out, which is the pay-per-view where you put money down to buy things. That is the entire point. Now, please do leave a comment below and let us know what you thought about last night's AEW Dynamite. Like the video, share the video, and subscribe. Head on over to whatculture.com where you can stay up to date with all the news, including when Daniel Bryan made debut in AEW. Come say hello on social media and watch every single ups and downs and video you can because I watch wrestling so you don't have to. My name is Simon for What Culture. Thank you for joining me as always, and I will see your ass, not literally, 